All right, so I think we've got, people are slowly coming over. I'm, I'm getting in the way of a good party. <laughs> so thanks everybody for joining us for the State of the School. Um, a special thanks to the uh, Hillsbrook, Hillbrook Parent Association officers, and so Kev and Christine in particular for um, uh, hosting this and helping us um, get people here. Right, round of applause. Right. Right. People have already started drinking. This should get pretty exciting. <laughs> um, and thanks for coming. Like we're, this, this is a you know a long-standing tradition at the school. Although this is only the second year we've done it outside in the spring, uh, and this feels like a really great adaptation. It used to be in like November, and it was indoors and. Um, now it feels like much more celebratory. Um, and it also has become, I think, another great community event. And so I will talk for 30 to 40 minutes, tops. Um, and then you'll have an opportunity to mill about a little bit around some of the tables, um, you know, to connect with some of our senior leaders and other people, but also just a chance to connect with each other. Um, and I think, you know, that is something that has become increasingly important. You know, last year I said because of COVID and still a little bit because of COVID, but also just feels in the world we live in today, increasingly important to find ways to bring each other together. So um, again, thanks for prioritizing making it this afternoon on a Friday afternoon. Um, it's so great to have you all here. So with that, um, I always like to start every year when I do this presentation with the vision and the mission and the core values. Um, and the reminder that this is what makes Hillbrook, Hillbrook. And so, you know, sometimes when we have brand new families or, you know, we're on uh, ad ad admissions tours, you know, people are like, so, you know, what makes an independent school or Hillbrook different from like other schools? Like, this is what makes us Hillbrook. This is what makes us different. It certainly makes us different from many other schools that don't have a strong sense of vision, mission, and core values. And so our you know, vision to you know, inspire students to achieve their dreams and reach beyond themselves to make a difference in the world, um, I hope is the reason, I hope that's the, what drew you here. Um, it is certainly the thing that is our North Star and drives our programming and how we approach um, everything we do um, with children, but also with adults and as a community. And then the other piece in particular is our core values, which of course I know you all know and your children certainly know. Um, and so be kind, be curious, take risks, be your best is something that is just alive on this campus each and every day. We've also been talking a lot about these, the vision, mission, and core values in the context of our expansion. So as we grow into a JK-12, this has been one of the slides that we start off with at each of those upper school presentations and we remind people or maybe help them understand for the first time that even as we are expanding, the high school's not a startup. It's an expansion of an existing program with 87 years of history and it's tied to a vision, mission, and core values that um, has been uh, doing extraordinary things with children for 87 years. So with that as a backdrop, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of some of the priorities that we've had this year, um, review some of that, and then um, jump a little bit into the looking ahead, um, which is a fun conversation about Vision 2030. Um, and you actually may have seen uh, one of Colleen's beautiful um, graphic recorded documents over there, um, which you'll have a chance to look at a little bit more after this meeting that um, talks about Vision 2030. But so I chose this picture. This was actually a picture that um, Kimberly Yarnell, who's out here somewhere, put into a slideshow earlier this year. And I love this photo. Um, so this is a photo from the late 1930s. And it's, of course, if you look around you, behind you, you know, it's of the Village of Friendly Relations when the students were building it. And they were building it in the late 1930s. And so whenever I'm in this space, I think about the village. And I think about like the deep roots that we have as a school in that idea, and the idea being that students, so, so to backtrack, 
for those who don't know the story. Um, the Village of Friendly Relations was something that was built by our students in the late 1930s because the then head of school, Mary Oram, had this idea of, of how do you bring kids together and help them understand the conditions for world peace. And she thought, well, what better way to do this? And you think of the context. It's like mid to late 1930s, on the precipice of World War II. It was a really challenging time. Uh, and she thought it was really important that kids learn to like work together. And so they actually went downtown and they purchased the supplies. They brought them back. They did all the building. They did in, uh, the whole village. And then it was an actual working village with a bank and a general store and a newspaper. And so all of those pieces. Back in the late 1930s, it was incredibly innovative, which I think is also something that continues to characterize who we are as a school. It ended up in Sunset Magazine, if people remember Sunset or know Sunset Magazine. And so, you know, when I when I think about that, you know, and the fact that we have now an amphitheater that's surrounded by that, it, it's it really is the tie to who we've always been. And so then, as I think about moving forward, like this, still, you know, um, actually this house right here was actually built by students. It's now been about 10 years, but th it's not that long ago. There was an actual group of students who were so inspired by the idea of the Village of Friendly Relations, they said, hey, can we build a house? And they did. It took them a lot longer than the kids in the 1930s. Um, it took them like three years. But they did manage over three years to build a house. Um, but so, you know, I don't know that we're going to keep building houses. We might build another house at some point, but you know, the, the, um, the metaphor of all the different ways that our, our educational program allows students to do things that are real and meaningful um, and that are tied to that concept of like what matters to you and what are you going to do about it and tied to that idea of world peace. So with that as, as a backdrop, um, you know, there were kind of four things that I wanted to highlight from this year. Um, that we've really been talking about a lot. And hopefully as I talk about these, are, these are things that you've heard about. I'm hoping this isn't the first time that you see this. Um, but so one of the things that we let off with from the beginning of the year was this notion of the just right challenge. And like, I think as a school, again, we've always believed in like working with every child as an individual. And then how do we make sure that they're being both supported, but then also being challenged at, you know, at the high end as well. And so um, this is a photograph of Kelly Skolton, um, who I hope many of you do know, um, but Kelly is our challenge coach. She's actually played a number of roles over the years, but this year she returned in a new role as a challenge coach, and she's been doing a lot of work with us and with children, um, providing challenge opportunities. And so in particular, um, this has been tied to math, and so we really decided this year to focus our challenge work on math. And so uh, these, these pictures, you see a couple of things on this um, slide. On the uh, my left side, so your left side um, as well, sorry. So as I'm looking like this on this side, um, you have the think tank box. And so in all of the lower school classrooms, there's a think tank box that is there that is a, a box that children at any time during the day, well, I shouldn't say it, probably not any time during the day, but at various times during the day, um, children can have an opportunity to go and pick some of those cards out. And what they are, um, the box, this picture is of a computation and number sense box. And what it is, is they're, or, they're, they're a, a series of activities in increasing order of difficulty. And they're a great opportunity for a child who is, you know, understands what's happening already in the math class and looking for something that's a little bit different, a little bit more challenging to kind of self-select into that. So that's one piece of like how, how do you provide challenge. Um, on the other side, uh, there's a, a picture of what is in every, uh, of all of our textbooks now, our, our new math program. There's a ready for more section. And so again, similar concept. So if you're working through a section and the child's like, I got this, they can jump to the end of that and go to the ready for more section and kind of self-select their way into that. We also, to be clear, the teachers are also paying close attention to this. And so, you know, they'll be the, you know, sometimes they'll have be the opportunity to be like, oh, it seems like you've got this. Maybe you should try the ready for more section. Or hey, have you maybe maybe you can go bounce over and try one of those think tank box activities. Um, you know, it feels like you have this, you feel like you ha you understand this. So those those are ways that are kind of like uh, you know, every day, day in and day out to provide additional challenge. The other thing that we're doing are these challenge groups, which are once a week um, in the lower grades. And these are also, um, children are given the option to like select in, and again, sometimes you know, a teacher might tap a shoulder and say, hey, I think you should, go, you should go try this. These are uh, facilitated by a separate teacher, Kelly Skolton, Ilsa Doman, our director of teaching and learning, and Jenny Jones are the three people who are facilitating these, or leading these right now. And these are small group activities, and they're um, fabulous 
really challenging math problems. So the example that I've, um, I saw one, maybe it's been six weeks ago now at this point, but that I've shared kind of in different settings, but this is one example of the activity. And so there was a problem where the students were given, there's you know 41 people, and the first person has a pie, and then they hit the second person in the face with the pie, and that person is out. The third person has a pie, they hit the fourth person in the face, and then they're out. Fifth person hits the sixth person, they're out. So you, so you go all the way through, the 40th person hits the 41st person, that person's out. Now you're back at the beginning. So the first person now has another pie, and they hit the third person in the face. This is making sense, so that person's out. So the math question is, who's the final person? Like, who's the last person who doesn't get, who, who doesn't get a pie? The answer is 19. Students um, you know, f can figure that out relatively quickly. And, and what they, uh, when we were watching them, Ilsa Doman talked about using brute force. You know, basically, like what they did is, you, you know, and this is what I, every time I try to remember this, you just write 1 to 41 on a piece of paper, right, and start crossing out. And then you can kind of quickly figure out what the right answer is. So that, that's interesting. But then the next step was then try to create a generalizable alg algorithm to solve for that. So if I gave you any number, can you come up with how you would quickly solve for that? That took a long time, <laughs> um, several sessions. And then the best part of that, and this has been true, and actually we were, I was with a par another parent last night who was mentioning um, how they were, the challenge group, how those problems were coming home and how much fun they were having as a family, like trying to go through some of these problems. One, one student went home and then wrote a Python program to like solve for that problem and then brought it back to the kids. So anyway, so, so this is a great example of what we're trying to do around challenge. You know, it's not simply you're doing well at math, let's, ha you know, let's hand you like five worksheets and make you work through lots and lots of problems and go more quickly. It's like how do you deepen the work you're doing and then also genuinely get students engaged and excited. So um, as I said, math is the place we've been focusing that primarily this year, but that's also true across the program. And so uh, an obvious example, you know, many of you have first or second graders, or you've had first and second graders, authors walk about. That writing activity is a fabulous example of like a low entry point. You know, like every child can enter and do something, but then if that child is like a passionate writer and like they can go, like there's no limit to how far they can go, right? And so the teachers are always trying to find ways to like, you know, sometimes the child's deciding to get inspired by that, sometimes the teacher's nudging them along to like push themselves a little bit harder. The other place that this plays out and is, was in our social impact and leadership projects. And so we had the impact summit um, just at the, the end of March for and all of the eighth graders is, and again, hopefully this is something that people recognize this name, but the social impact and leadership project is essentially an eighth grade capstone project. And they, every student is being challenged to grapple with what matters to me and what am I going to do about it? And they're choosing unique topics. And so they're doing all types of things. And so for example, I've got three um, different projects that are, are great examples. One of them, Edwin, in, the, in this picture on the left. Edwin um, ended up is doing a mural. He's actually still in the process of doing a mural in downtown San Jose. This had come out of an exploration about art and activism that they were doing with students in the fall. All of the eighth graders were involved in like better understanding kind of arts activism in downtown San Jose. And Edwin had a particular tie to an organization called the Healing Grove Community Health Center. And um, somebody at that center um, tragically died in early January. And Edwin made the decision to like create a mural to honor that person. And then in collaboration with the center is in the process of like working through that. And so you can imagine the complexity that's involved with like working with the center, agreeing to a design, agreeing to whatever, uh, I don't know that it's permitting, but whatever you know, approval needs to happen to have the design on the side of this large building. So he's doing all of that and then this summer we'll actually be finishing the mural. So that's one example, right? And again, you, you, going back to this idea of like just right challenge, like that's an incredibly challenging project that a 13, now 14 year old is working through. In the middle, Addie Crisco um, was really interested in climate change, climate justice. And so she took a short story Greta Thunberg wrote and she turned it into a play. And then she worked with fourth graders to put on that play. And then the, my favorite part of this story is actually then kindergartners, and I actually don't quite know how this happened, but somehow kindergartners got excited by this. And so kindergartners also 
um, made props and were involved. And so you basically had a kindergarten, fourth grade, eighth grade, eighth grader led activity around this play. Again, you know, so many lessons that Addie learned from that experience. And then finally, on the far right, um, Chloe Scott, um, who was passionate about reproductive just justice and actually ended up doing several different things. This picture is of a school-wide drive, which was right up here um, in early March, I think, if I remember correctly, um, where she, they were raising supplies, bringing together supplies for women in need. Um, and so you know, he had a whole group of students and adults of all ages and again, Chloe was running this, right? So this is the part where you, like, you think back to like, they're eighth graders. And so the opportunity for eighth graders to do like very real things that are tied to this idea of like what matters to you and what are you going to do about it is such a powerful example of how the Just Right Challenge plays out here at Hillbrook. So another topic that's been, that we've talked a lot, a lot about this year is high expectations. And so this is a picture of Heather and the um, wonderful lower school assembly that she has um, brought into the school this year. So every, when, or every other Wednesday, JK through fourth grade all come together. Um, it's been in the gym. I don't know, maybe it's with good weather, it might move out here. But it's been in the gym, and they come in, and it's a, about 10 to 15 minutes, and it's, you know, it's like an equivalent of flag, but it's very focused on they come in, they, all of the children are kind of like sitting in a very orderly fashion. They actually do mindfulness. You know, 150 JK through fourth graders, you know, all together in this space doing some mindfulness activities. And then Heather always has some kind of lesson and story that she tells. Um, one, one of the favorites was she talked about her dog and when her dog made mistakes and did that make the, a bad dog? And of course not. And of course, the best part was all the kids were like, of course that doesn't make her a bad dog. Um, but you know, all of these wonderful stories, and again, tied to helping children understand values and expectations, like you know, that like you can hold yourself to high expectations, and so that's been a really. I, I know teachers have loved that new edition, um, and children love that new edition. And it, it ends, um, at least a couple of the times that I was there, it ends with children doing like a call and response around the core values. And the week that I was there, there was a, a young student who um, has only been in the United States since the fall. And so his English is somewhat limited, but he's been doing a great job in the fourth grade. And he was leading it. And it was so great um, to have him up there leading all of the kids and the, you know, be kind, be curious. And they would all like shout back. So, so other ways that we've been talking about high expectations and you know, how do you, you know, raise the bar for kids and help them understand what they're capable of doing. Um, so student-led conferences. We've had student-led conferences for a long time in third through eighth grade. And so these are a couple of examples of ways in student-led conferences that students are asked to kind of reflect. And so for example, the one in the middle um, was an eighth grader reflecting on science. And so they did it for every class. And if you're, um, you know, if you were a, a parent of an eighth grader, you came into this conference and the students spent 10 to 15 minutes kind of walking you through like all of their different classes. What are things that they're proud about? What are things that they're working about? What's kind of their just right challenge? All coming from the students. And again, this is it, it very slightly third through eighth grade. Every, every grade's not the same, but there's some version of having children think and share with their parents and with their teachers what their expectations are for themselves, how they're doing, and that's what's so important, right, about learning. Like, this isn't happening to kids. You know, school, school is not for us. <laughs> school is for them, right? You know, it's just like putting kids in the driver's seat of their own education. But it also then gives us an opportunity to say to them, so what are you doing to challenge yourself? Right, you know, those are the questions that I'm sure you ask your children. So like, you know, you know, how, you know, you know how, how, are, how are you showing that you're living out the core values? And so it gives that way in a very formal way for us to do that with kids. Um, goal setting is another piece which is happening and then that's also particularly happening in some of the lower grades where Heather and the teachers were working with the children to set their own goals. Um, and uh, there's one, you know, just wonderful goals that you, uh, second graders, you know, it was everything from, you know, not getting distracted when I, when, in class to, I've now forgot, there, there was a whole set of them um, that I did, I talked about in one of my jams earlier this spring, but it, it's all very second grade appropriate, like right at their level. But again, it's sending them that message that like you can set, 
you can challenge yourself, you can set an expectation for yourself, and you can meet that. But the other piece is like when it doesn't work out, we can talk about that and like how do we what do we do with that? And that was the the other piece of those goals is like if it, if you're struggling with that, like what are the things that we can do? How can we help you? How can you help yourself to like reach the to reach those goals? The other thing in the and now turning a little bit more to the middle school. Um, Gully uh, and the middle school team have brought in an assembly this spring. Uh, it's called, called it, talking about no bullying. It was a it's called it was a no bully program, and they did a, a full assembly with kids, really focusing on moving from upstanders, sorry, from moving from bystanders to upstanders. Um, and some of the quotes actually that I from that assembly were really pretty compelling. And so, for example, one student um, said, following the assembly, you know, when people are feeling down, sometimes you need to give them space. Stand up for everyone and form a team of support. I see how this matter, how this makes me be more aware and support friends. And then this one I really like. One of the activities was that they had students working with kids they didn't know um, and, and learning something about them. And so one of the students said, I learned that we have a lot more in common with each other than you think. For example, I had a really big list of things in common with another eighth grader, and this makes me think before being mean. So, um, and Gully, I know they're doing a they're doing a, a presentation in a couple of weeks, which parents are invited to. If you want to know more about this particular program, but you know, for the purpose of this kind of conversation about higher expectations, like it's another moment to like name for kids. First of all, the expectations, like you know, we have expectations for how you treat each other, but also to like talk very explicitly with students that we recognize, you know, particularly in middle school is complicated and hard, and so we don't just assume that children have these skills. And we don't just, just and, we, and we know that kids won't always be nice to each other, just like we're not always nice to each other as adults. And so, like, part of this is like, how do you give them those skills, and then how do you give them the ability to repair something when they make a mistake? And so, um, that was a, that was another piece. And then finally, uh, in terms of our high expectations, I wanted to mention flag. Um, and I think you know, I, I think most people love flag. That's the general feedback we get. I don't know that people always recognize the kind of the curriculum of FLAG, um, you know, and what happens there. And in particular, um, you know, a huge shout out to Clara No, you know, who runs Stuco and the work that she has done over the last few years to make FLAG so student run. And so it is now a fully student led event. And again, going back to like expectations and challenge, it's, you know, it's the perfect opportunity for students to have a, to be up here and to speak in front of 400 plus people and um, we've always had it with jokes which is still you know my favorite part of flag is like you know kids coming up and telling jokes but now throughout flag all that entire experience is students up here talking about important things talking about you know sometimes doing silly and fun things they're running it and they're leading it and again they're having to keep like manage a group of 400 people as they're up on stage. So these are all way like, these are all ways in which children are really being shown like you can do hard things. Like you can take risks as we always talk about in our core values. One last part I did want to quickly just m mention reach beyond week again and I think in a similar context so we did so many amazing things on Reach Beyond Week, um, and hopefully you had a chance to read about some of them. Um, I, I participated in the trip to Washington, D.C., which was fabulous. Um, up here we have uh, a group of students went to a Pueblo in New Mexico. Um, there was a local circus arts experience. The art, there was an art installation. It was a, the um, downtown San Jose, a group of students were, were doing art as activism, and they finished the week by actually putting an art installation into a coffee shop. There's uh, the trip to um, Argentina, a trip to Tokyo and Japan. Uh, oh, there was a what, write a musical. So one group on campus like spent the week writing a musical, and then the final topic. Now I've forgotten what the topic was, because I, did, I didn't get to see it. Oh, it was about, uh, it was called The Farm, an original play musical about survival, ethics, and fairness. Um, and so, they, so that it was like, a, they had written it and then performed it at the end of the week. Um, and then there was a group of students who went to Yosemite in fifth grade. So, you know, uh, uh, this is an amazing slate of activities and experiences, you know, kudos. We have an amazing group of teachers who are putting this together, and of course the Scott Center, which is you know driving so much of this work on our campus. But you know, when, when I, what made me think about it in terms of kind of like high expectations, and also both that and just right challenge, is again it's another one of those experiences. Like kids are choosing, so they're selecting what they want to do. 
there's clearly a curriculum. Like there's things that specific things that they're learning, but there's also a lot of like kind of that hidden curriculum that we talk about in school. So for example, in Washington D.C., we traveled around through the metro. Like it was a real. So some of the kids have done that, and it was like whatever. But most of the kids hadn't spent a lot of time like bouncing between trains on a metro. Like that's a really interesting learning experience for them. Of like wow kind of independent, like I'm in a train in Washington DC and I'm choosing the line and I'm trying to figure out how to get from one train to another. Um, you know, some of the groups, you know, going, you know, obviously like going to places, you know, Argentina or, or, or Tokyo, like places for many of them, like, you know, long ways from home with a group of students, like there's so much learning that happens in those moments. So another thing I wanted to, to talk a little bit about today was about con community, and I, you know, I started that by saying like part of the goal of this event is to build community and to bring people together. And the picture, this picture was of the uh, uh, Hilbert Parent Association, you know, mid-year celebration at at Montebello um, uh, in downtown Los Gatos. But it, so we're always trying to find ways to bring people together. And again, I think particularly in this. Um, post-COVID world, but also in a world that feels different some, in, in some ways in terms of our ability to get together and be together with people on a regular basis. Um, so I just, you know, I had pictures of some of the ways in which this play out. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, oh, we always do and have, can, again, have been bringing back in full force this last couple of years is opportunities for families to be together at school and, you know, whether it's an in-class sharing or, um, you know, some of the, cell, uh, Lunar New Year, Holy. There have been some like you know l you know large school events which families have been an active part of organizing. Um, that bottom corner is a picture of a community conversation which was part of Vision 2030. We did a whole host of those. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we had a whole ho host of opportunities for people to come together and give thoughts on um, what they want what they want to see in the school in the next few years. Civic dinners, which I know I'm looking at. I know some of you have attended them. Our hope is, is that everybody has an opportunity to participate in a civic dinner. And, and what these are is uh, Annie, through the Scott Center, has brought this together. They're small group gatherings, and they are typically tied to a specific topic. One, this, this is a picture of a particularly moving event that I, I was able to, had the privilege of participating in a few months ago with a group of Persian families. Um, and it was tied to, uh, Actually, initially tied to like some students and some of their younger some of their younger children who were really interested and concerned about what's happening in Iran with particularly with girls, and so that conversation led to a conversation with Annie, which led to a conversation with some of the parents, and then an opportunity to host. And these civic dinners are there are opportunities to come together, but it's it's a, it's an event, and so you actually have like a very uh, like a formal kind of not form a protocol, it's not formal, but a protocol in which everybody at the table has an opportunity to share thoughts, to share ideas in a structured environment. They're incredibly powerful experiences in a day. It's it's a a very different. I I also have did a whole series of them with employees. So I invited all empl any employee who wanted to come have a civic dinner um, at my house in January, and so we did four or five of them. It's a really interesting way to get to know people, and the really interesting part about it is typically it's not the people you you, you spend all your time with. So, anyways, that, that that's a way of, that's a big plug. I know Annie and others were going to be trying to find ways to make that opportunity more and more accessible to people, um, but that has a, been a really compelling way, and I think it also really speaks to who we are as a school and the and the incredible both diversity but also commitment that we have to um, community, and then of course the benefit, which was a you know spectacular event, lar largest crowd ever. Um, and just you know, another great opportunity for people to come together, and then also, um, you know, raise important funds to support our flexible tuition, which is so core to who we are as a school. Couldn't resist. Take out your cameras. Um, uh, you know, if if you aren't following remarks and reflections or my my jam, um, you know, I would encourage you to. It is you know, it's every week. It's both. You can you can listen to the audio. You don't have to. You can also see the written version. It really is my effort to try to connect with people, um, you know, and, and in a way uh, to really have a regular connection. And then the other one, if you aren't reading, which is fabulous, is Ilsa Doman, our director of teaching and learning, writes curriculum connections every week, and they focus. They're very specific, looking at different grades and different activities that they're doing and, and it's really a really powerful way to get insight into our program um, and, and you know kind of I know sometimes families are like what's going on it provides like an interesting granular piece but it isn't just about your own child so it's also kind of an interesting opportunity to see what's happening kind of around campus and then finally um, you know expanding into a JK 12 like 
this is a huge undertaking that we have done this year. Um, and this, this is a great photo. This was the original group of students from Hillbrook when they signed to, to become part of our high school back in February. They each got a sweatshirt uh, and, they were, and then they put a, put a founding class. They, um, they were able to put, a, uh, put it on the sweatshirt. And so this was a great photo. We now are up to 34 kids. We have 16 kids from outside of Hillbrook who are joining, 18 kids who are going up, and we think the number might grow by a few more. Um, but you know, this fabulous group of 34 kids who will be in downtown San Jose next fall. And I just wanted to remind people, you know, we talked about this last spring when we talked about the initial idea. The driver for doing the upper school and for transitioning from a JK-8 into a JK-12 was this belief that students deserved this education and that, the, that there just were not schools in this area that were providing the type of education that we know that we're going to be able to provide as a JK-12. And so um, we have an extraordinary team of people um, led by Mike Peller. Um, there's a, that, that picture of Mike, they actually they, they put the founding class on their arms. They were having a lot of fun with the sweatshirts. Um, but so we have, we have a whole, this amazing group of teachers and leaders. And again, they're joining our JK-8. So we'll be, we, we've, we've been now noting for people like, you know, we'll be three divisions, two campuses, one school. Um, you know, and so this is a team. And, and, the, and one of the beautiful things that's already started to happen a little bit and will happen even more are the collaborations with upper school teachers and middle school teachers and lower school teachers. It's, and it's that connection across those campuses. The other thing that we've done is build a whole series of partnerships um, with organizations. Uh, COGX is an organization that's focused in the science of learning. Uh, Challenge Success is an organization out of Stanford. Denise Pope is really a leading voice around how to make school. Um, she, you know, it's focusing on well-being, engagement, and belonging. And in particular, it's focused on the high school, but it plays down into the full JK-12. And so she, that she's a, a real leading voice in how to design high schools, and we've been working closely with her. Uh, the Mastery Transcript Consortium is a group that is really focused on a competency-based architecture for learning. Um, and so that's something that we are, as we're, we have this great advantage because we're starting new of being able to build this structure as we, as we launch the high school. That will also then play back into the um, middle school. It's, a, it's tied to assessment. Um, Mike Peller, actually Heather Stinnett as well, um, Ilsa, we have a handful of people on this campus who know a lot about this, and it is, I think it's actually gonna be one of these like, incredible uh, changes that happens over the next few years kind of across the school in terms of how we think about feedback and how we think about students understanding that feedback and learning from it. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight was that this is, as we add grades 9, 10, 11, and 12, it's not just about the high school, and I keep saying that, but there are very concrete things that already are changing on this campus as a result of the addition of the high school. And so for example, this year's lunch clubs, middle school lunch clubs, um, Gully and the, and the team put together this like robust set of clubs. And it, was dri it really was driven in part by this idea of like, oh my gosh, we're going to have this high school, and what are we going to build across this 612? And so for example, there's a D&D &D club, there's a robotics club. Um, one of our new teachers for the upper school was a coach of like a champion, like a internationally championship robotics team. So we're really excited to see how that plays out across the um, 512 um, math club, choir club. There's all these opportunities for kids to pursue their passions. And then the other way it's playing out is, is in uh, math pathways. And so starting this spring, um, so we've always had an accelerated path for seventh and eighth graders. But starting this spring, if you look at this pathway, so the, the middle pathway, so there, there'll be a group of students who will be in like a seventh um, integrated math accelerated class, essentially an algebra class. Eighth grade, they would then go into math one. What's interesting about that eighth grade math one class is it's the equivalent of the same class that's being taught in the ninth grade. And so what will be happening this coming fall with our eighth graders who are going into that math one class is they will be taught by a teacher here, but they'll be, that teacher will be collaborating with our high school math teacher who will also be teaching math one. And there will be opportunities for those eighth graders and those you know, high school students to interact. The other thing that then happens is, and so if you go then so like to the far track, 
you know, some students are advanced enough that they might be in math one in seventh grade. So then in eighth grade, they can take a math two class. Again, this is a class that's then tied to the high school. And then by freshman year, they're going into a math three class. What makes this so powerful is that we now will have all of, the, so to some degree, this has always been true, but it's just been really hard because you don't, you have to find a way to have those classes taught. We now will have like that whole high school math curriculum, that whole high school math program, so that you're then playing that back down into the middle school. So that, so again, so these are just like a couple of like very concrete ways, which already we're seeing a shift in the way our JK-8 operates. So the other thing I wanted to just take a moment to talk about was um, data-informed decision-making. And I think, you know, as a school, we always like to think, and I think we are, like deeply intentional about how we approach the work that we do. And so I wanted to just highlight just a few of the ways in which we're using data to um, drive student experience. One that you probably haven't heard about is something called Thrively, and this is a, was a pilot program in the middle school that is, is evolving and, and will be fully instituted next year. Um, but what this is, is, is it's a, every Wednesday in middle school now, they have something called Wellness Wednesdays. And students are asked to answer a series of questions about kind of how they're feeling. So what you see up here then, and I, I'm not expecting you to be able to read this carefully, but what you see up here is it then, uh, it captures both on an individual level, but then also on a group level, like how are people feeling? So for example, right here, you've got, you can see high is green, moderate is yellow, and low is red. And so, you know, the majority of students are feeling moderate. Um, you know, a large group are also feeling high, and then there's a small group where, you know, it's low. Same thing across functioning and well-being. And again, this, that, that, the children are not asked that. Those are not the questions they're asked, but that's what then it pulls up to then determine what that means. What's, again, interesting about this is like, so advisors have access to this. And so, and students know that. So this is not like a, this is, this is they know that they're sharing data with, with adults that can see it. And so a couple things are happening. One is it's a great way, for, and again, these are middle schoolers, for a student to name I'm struggling or I'm having a hard time, right? And it's a way like every week they get to answer this. So that's one thing that can happen. The other thing that happens is it gives you an opportunity on a larger group level to be able to track that, right? So you might all of a sudden see like, wow, like most weeks it's been, you know, almost everybody's been yellow. All of a sudden we've got like a huge group of reds, like what's going on, right? And so then all of a sudden it may, if, if you see it at a larger group level, this might be a larger topic. Gully and the team are using this to kind of like track things, you know, week over week, and then kind of over longer periods of time. Um, the other piece to this, and we were, I was talking with, a, we were talking with another group of parents the other day about this, it also gives you a chance, you can actually compare, you're comparing against yourself too, right? So again, so to some degree, because somebody asked this question, like there's a, you might remain, you might be green like every week, and then all of a sudden you pop to yellow. And so that's noticeable, right? So but because of the way they're able to look at the daddy, they can see that. Right, so they can see that like, boy, this kid's been a green every week all year and all of a sudden they're a yellow. With another kid, you might not be worried because they've been yellow all year. But this kid, like, ooh, that's a change. So it's really opening up opportunities for adults to connect with kids and to understand how they're feeling. So again, so th this, is a, this is a new thing. This I think is like a, a super, we talk a lot about trying to understand belonging and how students feel about, these, about their student experience. This to me is like one of the most powerful tools we've been able to find that it feels very authentic. It's, it's consistent, so we're asking it about on a regular basis and it's also actionable. So it's something that adults can utilize in real time. Different, a totally different uh, topic, but a, a kind of similar concept around data. One of the things that we used with, with the social impact and leadership this year is a, is a program called, or an app called Unruler. And so Unruler is, and again, you can see, um, it's, it's like a social media app. <laughs> so, so what you can see is like, so, so for example, Josh Horton here, each of those is a, is a unique entry. And so essentially what students do with it and what the way it was used this year in social impact and leadership was at the end of each you know, session typically, they would provide a quick reflection and there was usually some kind of prompt of like, you know, how did it go this week? And so you're providing the quick reflection and then the teachers and people can kind of check in and like, oh, how's it going? It also gets, so then for the student, it also then allows them over time to like reflect back on. 
long term, unruler is going to be tied to, I was, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago this idea of a competency based architecture. It's going to be tied to this idea of like how do students track over time their, how they're doing against these, um, against their, uh, the learning, the, the um, outcomes that we're striving for. And it gives them a way to like hold on to that. And so it becomes this portfolio for students through the years that they can then you know, look back at and reflect back on their learning and their growth. So, so uh, that really, and this is a super interesting app, and actually if you get a chance, I know Annie, I, I think Vanessa might be here. If you, it, during, uh, after this, I'd encourage you to talk to them and find out a little bit more about how they're using that. Um, and then another way we use data are uh, you know, school surveys. And so, you know, thank you. Uh, we had a, you know, a, a number of families last fall res responded to our family survey. Um, and so um, that was inc it's an incredibly, incredible amount of information, which was incredibly helpful for us as we think about how to structure. The big takeaways in the, in the case of this survey, the big takeaways for us were, um, you know, you know, overall, lots of lots of satisfaction around things that are important: um, facilities, culture, DEI, leadership, teachers, transportation, communication. The biggest areas of improvement were things tied to well, two things. One was around educational skills and program, and in particular around what there's a reason we've been talking a lot about the Just Right Challenge around this question of our ability to work with individual children and challenge them. And so that was a that was a piece of feedback that we were seeing last fall that were like. We need to figure that out. Like, how do we how do we do that better? How do we better understand that? Um, so the the other um, th so I do want to take one one other thing that was worth noting, particularly around DEI and the Scott Center, is those results were incredibly affirming around people's understanding and belief that those were important, <laughs> and like that, that, that the recognition that. The things that we talk a lot about, that we say, like, this is really important, that, that there's a really strong alignment with families saying, yes, we agree. These things are really important, and this is, you know, this is, this is really matters to us um, as members of this community. So finally, um, looking ahead, I love this photo. <laughs> Vision 2030. So Colleen Shilley, um, associate head of school, has done an amazing job this year, along with Coy Ross, um, board member, as, uh, as co-chairing this Vision 2030 process. Um, and so just very briefly, um, you know, right now you can see uh, on this red thing, we are in the March and April timeline. Essentially, the process launched in August. The survey was a piece of this, was, was a piece of the process of trying to pull in together data. Um, in the November, January timeframe, we had several strategic planning committees. So it was a strategic planning committee, which was made up of um, senior leaders, teachers, staff, um, and then uh, board members and parents. That group met several times over the course of the year. One of the big highlights of this process were the community conversations. Um, and so just very quickly, so there, this, here the, the, by the numbers, the quick community conversation engagement, there were 70, seven community conversations, 90 people participated, 139 what if questions, 143 how might we questions. That's a conversation. We, we thought that was actually kind of interesting. They were basically the same number of those. but um, And then 85 bold ideas. The point here, there were lots of parents who, in, who engaged with us in this conversation. And we hope, as the final plan comes out, so to go back here quickly, we're in the final drafting stages. Again, you'll have a, in a moment, you'll have an opportunity to see kind of the outlines of the draft um, at a high level. And then we are, the goal will be to have the board approve this plan in September or August and as we launch into the next school year. Our hope is, is that um, when you see this plan, uh, both now and then also in the fall, that you'll see reflected in that plan things that are important to you, um, and that you know, and the, and things that you mentioned or that you know other people mentioned in some of those community conversations. There are three broad pillars to the plan. Um, one is an, is the idea of what we're calling prioritizing balanced excellence, um, and this is the idea of bringing together this the importance of academic excellence with the importance of well-being and like and you know and creating a program and experiences that 
um, do that for students. The other piece to that is with employee, and we talked about as well as like with employees and community members as well around like health and, and wellness. Second thing is making Hillbrook a community hub. One of the strongest things that we heard coming out of the community conversations was the need and the desire for families to find ways to connect, to connect both with activities with their students and their children and the school, also with other adults. Um, and so we're really seeking ways to strengthen that. A lot of conversations around um, after school programming, how do we extend that? You know, we have an increasing number of families who are you know, dual working families with incredibly busy lives. Like how as a school can we support that? How can we provide the programs so that families aren't having to shop around for everything after school? Like that you can become the place where this really is the hub for your family from JK through 12. Um, and then the final topic uh, category is broadening our institutional reach and impact. Uh, you know, we for a long time with the Scott Center, with the Center for Teaching Excellence, with um, the work that we've done around technology, we're one of the first schools in the world to have iPads. We've always been a school that's been on the leading edge of important developments in education. And so we're trying to, and, and increasingly other people recognize that as well, other schools recognize that. So a piece of this as well is like how do we build on that and how do we um, both engage outside of Hillbrook, but also really take on a leadership role um, outside of Hillbrook. So those are the kind of three big buckets. I encourage you to go over there. Um, uh, with that, I encourage you to go over there to learn that. The other piece, there are a whole series of tables. You can look at this quickly and get a sense of like the things that you might be interested in learning more about. Um, and finally, um, we have a QR code for a survey. One of the things that we are um, committed to this year is trying to get more feedback. Um, and so if uh, th this is the, to be for full disclosure, this is the, a similar survey. It's the one that we did about a month ago. So some of you may already have filled it out. Um, but if you haven't completed this survey, it's about um, belonging. And I would, I would encourage you to, to fill that out. We're trying to gather as much data as we can from families. Um, and uh, just finally, thank you again. Thanks, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, please stay around. Uh, you know, there's there, your kids are in extended care. Take advantage. Of, maybe some of your kids are in extended care. Take advantage of that. Uh, but we have wine, we have food, um, and we're just really excited to have you here today. So thanks.